the rate of melt in summer uh, was something that we knew about and it was gradually increasing. Then suddenly it's multiplied itself by about seven or eight. There's 30 million tonnes an hour. When I was last up there, it was more like 30 million tonnes per day. That's just something unheard of. And uh, so we're really worried about what's going on with Greenland. Welcome to Facing Future. 80% of Greenland is covered with glaciers that can be up to a mile thick. Most of its 56,000 residents live in the ice-free coastal areas. And until recently, the mass of ice was largely in seasonal balance. But new research has shown that the ice sheets are now losing an average of 30 million tons an hour. That's more than a trillion tons since 1985, and that loss is accelerating in this century due to climate change. The fresh water entering the ocean from this melting has major implications for the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, which is critical to maintain global weather patterns. With me today to discuss all of this are Peter Wadhams, Emeritus Professor of Ocean Physics at Cambridge University, and climate scientist Paul Beckwith. Welcome to you both. Hello. Peter, how serious is the situation in Greenland? Well, it's very serious because it's unprecedented. That is, the rate of melt in summer uh, was something that we knew about, and it was gradually increasing, um, and we knew what the various sources were. Then suddenly it's multiplied itself by about seven or eight. There's 30 million tonnes an hour. When I was last up there, it was more like 30 million tonnes per day. We're now gone to an hourly rate for what used to be a daily rate. And uh, when you're up on the ice sheet, you see big changes. There's always large meltwater streams, holes filling up with, with water. It's a very dynamic scene, but it's not nearly as dynamic as it is now because everything is speeding up by a factor of about eight. That's just something unheard of. And uh, so we, we, we're really worried about what's going on with Greenland. It hasn't figured into the climate models, uh, the full extent of it until now. So it's 20% greater than they had anticipated. Paul, what have you unearthed about Greenland's dire situation here? Well, I think... Um... For quite a while, people have been focusing on uh, the the Arctic. I mean, we know that the um, Arctic uh, temperature amplification is huge. So, the, I mean, the Arctic as a whole is warming, I always say, five to eight times faster than the, the global average. Um, for the longest time, all of the newspaper articles and mainstream scientists were saying it was double. And, uh, you know, now at least they're saying three times or some of them are saying four times. So they're getting closer, but as you go further and further north, mm. the warming um, ratio is much, much higher. So in the high Arctic, it's warming about eight times faster than the global average. So of course, this is a huge underlying factor for huge melt rates on Greenland. We have very good data on measuring the mass of both Greenland and Antarctica, the gravity anomaly satellites uh, flying in tandem. And we've seen melt rates at least doubling every, what, seven to 10 years, typically, both for Greenland and also for Antarctica. And uh, we're still focused mostly on the Northern Hemisphere, but with all that missing Antarctic sea ice and warming water, people are very concerned also with the Antarctic uh, glacier melt. And they're tied together because the melt rates greatly increased at, at one pole. You know, the, the, the rise in sea level can lift up floating ice shells and, and cause uh, accelerated melting at the other pole. So there's a connection, of course, between them. People are going to be very surprised, I think, at the, at the accelerated growth of sea level rise in, in the next, uh, you know, decade, decade or two. 
let alone. Well, what, know, are, what are we actually looking at? I mean, if all of Greenland melted, it would be 25 feet of sea level rise, according to what I've read. What What is it likely to be within the next? Are we likely to see something significant within the next couple of decades? Well, there, the jury's out on that. We don't know for sure. But um, I mean, Hansen has said in the past, uh, he wouldn't be surprised if we had five meters of sea level rise by 2100. He said that a number of years ago when the IPCC models were showing about uh, half a meter. Yeah, that, I mean, of course, that is, is James Hansen, the famous NASA scientist um, yeah. who testified before Congress uh, famously and warned everybody years ago and has now written several papers that are quite alarming. Right. You know, it's a work in progress. I mean, the rates are definitely accelerating. And uh, of course, we're seeing a huge acceleration in global average temperatures. We're seeing a huge acceleration in ocean water heating. So all of these things um, are mean, mean that the sea level rise rates will have to be re- revised continuously. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I fully expect, uh, you know, I think Hansen's probably underestimating with his five meters by 2100. Peter, um, as these uh, as the fresh water goes from the glaciers into the ocean, this is affecting the ocean in a couple of critical ways. The CO two levels and the um, the fact of the fresh water entering it is is how much is that going to interfere with the ocean currents? Well, we that's again a jury jury's out on it, um, but it's a very large effect. I think the first of all the the water. Um, doesn't go straight down. People used to think, well, there's a load of sort of plug holes in the ocean, where which are called mulag, where the water runs swirling down like water down the plug hole of a bath and mysteriously disappears. In fact, what seems to happen, for people who are studying it now, is that the water is running into a kind of complete network of water masses that are going in a sort of a slant, heading in general for the ocean, but not getting there immediately. So there's an effect which we don't really understand, which is how the water actually reaches the ocean and how fast it goes. But that water has only one place to go, which is the ocean. And that one place is filling up and we we have to consider how fast it's actually going to be um, causing sea level to rise. And that uh, is is frightening. Hansen, I think. As the water goes under, goes below, it's, it's creating a different surface for the ice above it. So more ice would be melting if there's more water below it? Well, yes, the ice melt mechanism is is something where we we get alternating massive amounts of of ice disappearing. For instance, we were working on a glacier in northwest Greenland, and it just completely fragmented into large lumps, which drifted off in different directions, and uh, we, we then studied one of them. But that is something that that happens if there's a right enough stress um, in the ice cover. And um, you can have a benign period when nothing happens. And then suddenly an entire uh, glacier vanishes or s- smashes itself up. Um, so we it's hard to say exactly. It doesn't go in a smooth way. And we, we, we have a problem to to explain which how how this is happening. And uh, so I think Hansen is right in expecting a higher rate than models give. He always has a healthy contempt for models, which is, I think, correct, because nearly always models are inadequate, especially intergovernmental panel on climate change models. Well, this discrepancy and other discrepancies are really alarming because most people are listening to what happens with the IPCC and what happens at the COP. And, you know, it, if these are wildly inaccurate 
And that's what people are quoting. You know, this is really a problem. Where do we go for accurate information on on what's really occurring in our planet? Well, the problem, I think one big problem is that, you know, the scientists are, they're very willing to talk about their own research for a start. They're very reluctant to talk about research that's being done by other scientists that's sort of unrelated to their direct, uh, you know, sort of tunnel vision field, if you like. Um, and um, they don't want to um, make projections unless there's a computer model backing them up. And the computer models only incorporate what we know, and we're learning lots of new things about the ice. So some of the things that are happening now that aren't certainly incorporated in the models are we had all of these massive wildfires in Canada and in uh, Russia last year, and the soot and ash from those wildfires, a lot of it finds its way up into the Arctic and uh, deposits itself on top of the ice sheets and makes them much darker and makes uh, surface melting much larger. And the density of water is 10% higher than the density of ice. So the water is very heavy on top of the ice. It's it's also at a warmer temperature than the ice, so it's like a drill. It just um, it it just pushes its way by because of gravity, and it's heavier through the ice, honeycombing the ice, eventually getting to the uh, bedrock and lubricating it to increase the flow rate of the glaciers. And it also weakens them. It's like Swiss cheese. So if it's an ice shelf, I think Peter was referring to one of the Larsen um, ice shelves, maybe Larsen B or. You know, we've had Larson A, Larson B, Larson C. We've had major ice collapses, and uh, they happen almost uh, overnight when they eventually go. And then this massive uh, ice shelf has suddenly become ice cubes, which then drift off and, and melt, um, drift off to lower latitudes in the case of the Arctic. Well, and then that melt. was, of course, so, in Antarctica, the Larson ice mm, shelves. The, yeah, the Larson, yes, the Larson's in Antarctica, but uh, also similar things with the. Um, some of the glaciers on on in western Greenland. So the mechanism for ice melt is is the same. Of course, you know it doesn't for Antarctica and and uh, the Arctic. But it's um yeah. So we have these these massive um, intermittent collapses. And if you look at the paleo records at sea level rise, we had these meltwater pulses occurring in the sea level rise records. So most of sea level rise up until recently is from water expansion. You know, we heat the water, it expands, but more and more is as a result from the Greenland and Antarctica glaciers. There's also con contributions from uh, alpine glacier melt and things like that. But the darkening of the ice from um, the wildfires in Canada, you know, and, and Russia, I think is a huge problem. I think that's been accelerating things. Also, Hansen talks about the Earth uh, energy imbalance getting ever higher very, very rapidly because of the um, increased absorption of sunlight. I think some numbers show that the Arctic uh, reflectivity has decreased about half a percent. So it's a much darker place. It's going to absorb that much more solar radiation and greatly increase the Arctic amplification even more. And we're also mm -hmm. seeing that in the southern hemisphere with the lack of, with all that missing um sea ice around Antarctica. So so that's one factor. I mean, we're always finding out new things about ice. Uh, there's things like marine ice uh, cliff instability. The ice is only so strong. So if uh, the ice shelf is undercut or ice sheet is undercut because of a retrograde slope or something, then eventually you get towers, you know, you get these ice cliffs that are just too high to support their weight. So, so you tend to get cascading. So there's lots of domino type effects that Peter was talking about. It goes steady for a while and then suddenly you have a massive um, a massive impact, a massive collapse of ice sheets. The glacier I was talking about uh, was the uh, Peterman Glacier, which mm -hmm. is actually in, in Green, northwest Greenland, um, as an example, because we were actually working on the Peterman Glacier and in fact standing on it when it carved and uh, a great big lump of the, the glacier came off with us on it. And uh, you experience directly the effect of, um, of glacier carving when you actually 
standing on a glacier, it breaks off and the whole the whole thing changes its position of equilibrium. So you're you're suddenly going up in the air. And that's something which resulted in the whole of that glacier just disappearing or into turning itself into pieces and the pieces had different fates. One one of them ended up grounded on Baffin Island and that's the one we studied. But that was a major glacier. So you've got that those sort of things going on. And as uh, Paul's mentioned, is uh, black ice. And uh, that's something that's being actively studied at the moment. Um, and in fact, we're, we're studying it with the Polytechnic in Turin, that um, we, we've got lots of, lots of ice samples on, from the top of the ice sheet in Greenland. And we've got lots of, of ice samples and gunky samples from brush fires occurring in the area of the Greenland glaciers. And we're finding that if we sample the ice and we sample the brush fires, there is a, a big overlap. There's a lot of black stuff falls onto the ice sheet originating from um, fires. And so we, we've got a, a mixture of fires and we've got um, the, the ice sheet itself. And so we're, we're, we're at the moment working with samples from both the ice sheet and from neighbouring fires. And uh, we're, we're, we're producing a, a report come paper on that at this at this very moment. So uh, I might be able to bring some of the data to show you. So the ice um, gets dark, but then it snows the following winter. How much does that snow actually cover cover up our tracks, so to speak? Well, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really, because the melt continues. I mean, the, if you walk on the Greenland ice sheet, you find you're not walking on ice at all. You're walking on mud, and the the mud is the stuff that's been falling on the ice sheet and getting muddy from the meltwater and you, you're ending up with something that isn't like ice at all. It's not even slippery. And that's like that all the time. So the next year, that layer of mud will reveal itself again and and you'll get, you'll, you'll get the same thing going on. You're, you're not going to have a nice pristine white layer of, uh, of ice so yeah, we I were mean, worried it, about the blue ocean event, but now it's even more worrisome, the dark ice event. The dark <laughs> ice event. Um, the other thing is, is um, there was a very interesting paper uh, a few months ago talking about how the jet streams are getting kind of stuck and you get this um, blocking event where the jet stream is so wavy that it extends upwards over Greenland and comes back down. So it exposes Greenland, even at the highest levels, to uh, tremendous heat and even melting at the very tops of Greenland, you know, at the highest elevations. And um, it also uh, leads to more, we're getting more um, rain events in the Arctic and, and fewer snow events. So often the precipitation that used to fall as, as snow is now falling as rain or, or freezing rain. And um, we're getting this phenomenon, we're getting these uh, so-called atmospheric rivers actually coming high up into the Arctic and uh, dropping tremendous precipitation, in the, mostly in the form of rain on, on these glaciers. So you can get periods of time when these uh, atmospheric rivers are operating where you get extremely high melt rates for a period of time on, on Greenland. And these atmospheric rivers are the same phenomena basically, that's been uh, inundating California, you know, over the last week, causing tremendous flooding there. So, so um, yeah, so it's not just melting from, from temperature, it's melting from um, rainfall on, on the actual glacier. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an area of glaciers at, at the very top that's called the accumulation zone, where snowfall in that region exceeds um, the melting but as the glacier melts, the whole thing um, is at lower elevations. 
you get this very powerful elevation feedback effect where as you lose more and more ice, the, the rate of ice loss increases because the whole glacier is, is at lower elevations and therefore warmer, warmer temperatures subjected to these rain events. You, you mean the, the ice sheet is, a, is, is, low, is less thick? But that's what you mean by yeah. lower elevation. Yeah. 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 So the okay. ice, uh, the thickest ice on Greenland is about uh, three kilometers uh, thick on, on the uh, highest, highest points. So as mm -hmm. it um, melts to lower elevations, the melting can, can accelerate. Um, so it's melting from above and it's also melting from below from the water that's seeping through the moulins and into the, the lower part of the ice sheet. Uh, so this yeah, is kind of a it, double problem. It, also, I believe the water, the land is sinking. <laughs> yeah, mile. well, on both continents, both poles, you have this ice that is sitting on bedrock well below sea level. So the ice isn't in buoyancy equilibrium. It's not floating ice. So that ice, as it melts back, eventually it'll reach a point where it is buoyant in the water. In Greenland, it's melting from both the surface and below to a very, very large amount. In Antarctica, most of the melt is actually from below because <laughs> the air temperature is still well below zero. So, you know, if you warm from minus 40 Celsius to minus 30 Celsius, you're, it's not going to cause the ice to melt in a, on the surface in Antarctica, right? It's the water below that's warming and, and getting far inland on the West Antarctic ice sheet. So Greenland has these areas also where massive ice sheets are sitting on bedrock so when they melt, um, they raise sea level um, because they're not they're not floating. They're not in buoyancy equilibrium. All right. Is there anything else that we we need to say before we close? Uh, well, just to mention the death of a very fine scientist that that we all knew called Connie Stephan, which was due to this same effect of of rain and melting ice. Uh, because he ran a place called Swiss Camp, which was a hut where he, he, he stayed most of the year looking at melt rates. And uh, he was convinced that the, that the melt rate of, um, of Greenland was something higher than IPCC was saying. And he think, thought it was something like four metres a year. This was a, a, and he was collecting the evidence for this. Uh, when unfortunately he uh, he fell in down a, a moulin at, at mm -hmm. uh, Swiss camp and died. But he had a very strong view about the rate of melting. And of course, it was borne out by the fact that his camp was swept away, basically, by the, uh, the, the fact that it was raining and, and snowing at the same time. So... I think we should remember Connie Stefan and think. This, this yeah, is, and, and I think he'd been going to this uh, camp for, for decades. Yes. Right? yes. And uh, it was perfectly safe to, to work at for many, many decades. But because of the greatly increased melt and the appearance of new moulins, and maybe there was a bit of an ice bridge above the moulin. I mean, sometimes when, uh, when you fall in a crevice, you don't know it's there. You know, the ice, the, the snow carrying your weight is just thinned and thinned and thinned and then gives way. I, I just want to also mention that the Arctic uh, sea ice and Antarctica sea ice is very crucial for the stability of on-land glaciers because when you lose the sea ice um, on the outskirts of these glaciers, not only is the water temperature greatly increased, um, melting the, the glaciers on the fringes, but also you get much higher uh, wave action so the wave action can can repeatedly hit the ice and uh, etch it away um, at the interface. So it's almost like you think of the analogy, you know, you remove a cork from a bottle. I mean, the, the sea ice being the cork that you're removing and then all the champagne pours out while well, all the ice on the, the land can start pouring out in, onto the ocean at ever greater rates, which we're seeing in Antarctica and uh, Greenland mm -hmm. as well. Well, it seems like it's getting increasingly dangerous. I was going to ask you about that earlier, actually, Peter, when you were describing being on a glacier that was actually calving at that point to study uh, polar regions. 
Uh, but thanks to all the scientists who are doing that and to your friend who has now passed away, his life work is uh, of incredible value to humanity. And thank you both for being here today on Facing Future. Thank you.